Hi everyone. Um, I've got a tissue here, so I might sneeze. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to um, share with you, if you'll allow me, to, um, to share a story that happened to me on the 17th of August this year. So I was um, trawling through the internet in my digital rabbit hole, um, enjoying my little digital rabbit hole, and um, I found an amazing talk from uh, between a guy called Bob Moritz, who's our global PwC chairman, and an amazing lady called Melody Hobson. Some of you may know of her. She did a TED talk called Color Brave or Color Blind. Now, I found this TED talk to be amazing. It really inspired me. It taught me so many things I didn't know about what it's like um, to be a black woman um, growing up in corporate America. I was really inspired by it. She talked about being unapologetically black. I was so inspired by it that I decided I have to share this with um, my lovely friends on Twitter. I'm slightly obsessed with Twitter. Um, I'm, that is totally my rabbit hole. Um, I've got just over 70,000 followers on Twitter and I tweet stuff every day, um, sometimes just to motivate myself. Um, but also to motivate everybody else. And I do stuff on there about diversity and inclusion. Sometimes I talk about the work that we do in international development um, and our work with DFID and the FCO. And sometimes I talk about what it's like to be a gay man in British business. So I'm quite interested in equality. So I've cultivated the 70,000 odd followers who I would say are quite open-minded. Um, they're my 70,000 people. You know, I feel like they're mine. Um, so, um, so you can imagine my horror when after 24 hours, the tweet that really inspired me, Melody's conversation with our chairman, the tweet that really inspired me, that I learned so much from, had been retweeted and liked by absolutely zero people. <laughs> zero people. Nobody, nobody was prepared to share a story about a black woman in corporate America. Nobody, zero. Absolute tumbleweed. Um, and I was really horrified by this. I mean, I, to give you some context, I can tweet a picture of my shoes. <laughs> and I know they're fabulous, aren't they? Um, <laughs> I could take a picture of my shoes, I could tweet it, and I swear to God, I could get 10 retweets within an hour. So 24 hours on a topic that really meant something to me and means something to so many people, a topic that really has meaning and inspiration, nobody would engage with it. So um, I decided I have to try and understand this more. And a few days later, I decided to do a Twitter poll um, to see you know, what were people thinking? Why didn't they engage? And I thought, you know, why, why wouldn't they engage with this? You know, part of me thought for a second, is it, you know, is it because I'm gay, I'm not allowed to talk about being black? I'm not allowed, I'm not licensed to do that because I'm not black and I can never understand what it's like to be black. Am I, but am I only allowed to talk about gay stuff? Uh, which is, you know, maybe that's how it is. Um, maybe people are scared to talk about it. Maybe people don't think it's an issue. Uh, maybe it's just not relevant to them. Maybe they just decided it's not something they want to get involved in. Well, actually, my Twitter poll came back. I let it run again for 24 hours. My Twitter poll came back. And 57% um, of people who responded to that poll said they were scared. They said they were scared to get involved in a conversation about what it's like to be black in America. And I, I was horrified again by this. Um, and to give you some context, that tweet was retweeted over 400 times. So they could engage with that, but they were scared to engage with the topic of being black. So again, my horror is kind of escalating and escalating. And I decided to do some research. Um, but first I thought I'll chat to some colleagues. Um, I chatted to an amazing colleague of mine who's um, now moved to work in another country, Sarah. She's fabulous, and she would totally agree that she's fabulous, by the way. Um, so there's no harm in quoting her. Um, she said to me, Andy, you know what? I met some new colleagues um, in our London Bridge office. Uh, we were going for lunch. I'd never met them before. We'd agreed to meet up. And um, one of them phoned and said, how will we know it's you when we meet? 
how will we know that's you, Sarah? So she said, she said well, I've got, she said, I've bought this amazing new dress. So she had this beautiful blue dress, had lovely white piping on this dress. She said, Andy, I've described everything about me to these people so they can spot me. But the one thing I didn't say was, I'll be the black woman in reception. You won't miss me. <laughs> so even our youngest, most powerful women in our business, a young, powerful black woman in our business, in an open-minded business, BWC wins loads of awards for being open-minded, a young, powerful black woman in our business felt that she couldn't say, I'm a black woman, because she didn't want to offend her white colleagues. She didn't want to create an awkward moment. So I'm still horrified by this. So I start to look for some stats on this. Um, and um, what I find out is that actually 23%, sorry, of new graduates that join organizations in the UK, graduates who are black actually earn 23% less than their white counterparts. I was shocked, horrified by that. Um, I found out that if you look at the um, stats for, if you try to look for stats for black men and women or women and men in organizations in the UK, actually there's, there's a real gap in terms of statistics. Uh, but what we do have are some statistics around black and minority ethnic. So the black uh, women and men are part of that, obviously. Um, and this is even more disturbing that between 2014 and 2015, of the FTSE 100 companies, there were 0.7% of those between 2014 and 15 were from BME communities or identified as BME communities. So our black women and men would be within that percentage. The following year, 2015 to 16, that number had dropped to 0.1%. So the leadership of these organizations, our top 100 organizations, are becoming less diverse, less ethnically diverse every year. In fact, this year we lose over 30 BME leaders from the top 100 businesses in the UK. So not only are black women and men as graduates paid less as they come into the organization, we're losing them at the top of the organization. And this is about leadership at all levels of our organizations. So this is clearly a problem. So I'm thinking, you know, what do, you know, what am I going to do about this? Um, and I thought, you know, I'll go back and I'll watch Melody Hobson again. I'll watch that video again properly. I watched it, I thought I watched it properly the first time, but let me watch it again and really listen to what she says and see if she's got some advice for me. And so I watched it with fresh ears and fresh eyes. And I'd encourage you to Google Melody um, and have a look at her video. The, there, was, there were a number of things that stood out for me. One of the main things was, she says, we've observed this problem for too long. And we really have. We've talked about um, this issue of ethnic diversity, about the progress of black women and men in business for too long. But one thing that really struck me was, she said, do something with your power. People need to do something. Do something with your power. So, I mean, honestly, that's why I'm here with you today to talk about this topic. I was asked to do a talk here, um, not because we sponsor this event. Um, <laughs> I was asked to do a talk before we sponsored. Then I felt guilty, I thought we should sponsor. Um, <laughs> so I was asked to do a talk, and I was asked to actually do a talk about our work in international development, our work to try and get a million girls into education across Africa and South Asia, our work to um, improve um, police reform in the Congo, our work on economic development across Africa and South Asia. Um, and I'll work to fund many, many projects and deliver results. And I decided I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that because the thing that's burning a hole in my head right now, the thing I really want to talk about is why are more black women and men not progressing through our organizations? I talk about the other stuff all the time and I love it. It keeps me alive. It's the stuff I'm really proud of. And when I die, I'll look back on my life and I would have done amazing projects that I'm really proud of. But this is what's in my head today. And that's why I wanted to share it with you, because I want to use my power today to help you to get involved in this um, challenge, if you like. So I thought I've got to make it easy for you. 
So I, again, I went back through all the stuff and I tried to summarize what was going on. Um, so the most important thing is for us to get involved in the conversation. We have to fight that fear. Imagine a world where we didn't do anything because we were scared of having a conversation. Imagine a world where we just avoided every conversation because we were scared of offending people, scared of saying the wrong thing. We have to start the conversation about what it's like for our black women and men in business. We have to start that conversation. So the first thing I would say to you, and I've got five things, so you can keep me honest, so I don't do five, I might do seven, hopefully it's five. There's normally only three, and then there'll be like two extra ones. Um, I'm giving you a special deal today, there'll be five. So the first thing is have, be prepared to have the conversation. Second thing is, I don't know about you, but what I notice a lot um, in our professional lives is that we tend to listen to people in order to know where to insert our point of view. Um, I certainly feel like that sometimes at work, that no one's actually listening to me. They just want to know when they can stick their point of view into the conversation. Um, in the context of this really important discussion and exploration, we really must listen in order to understand. So we must listen to understand. We must ask questions to clarify our understanding, which is quite different from what we often do. Thirdly, we must really understand and accept the other person's truth. So this is a really big thing for me, that we, you know, if you're really trying to understand a different perspective, and I, you know, I can never, I will never ever be able to fully understand what it's like to be black, because I'm not. And I'm not trying to save anyone who's black. I don't think anyone needs to be saved, but I need to learn. So if I want to learn, I have to accept that other person's truth. So my job in that conversation is to be curious, to learn, to explore, and to understand what those barriers are that are stopping people progress, progressing. So I have to accept that truth and not challenge that truth, but understand it. The fourth point I would say is that we, as I mentioned earlier, we've observed this problem for way too long. We have to take action, we have to do something. So we have to use our own power. I don't know what each of your wonderful, beautiful strengths are. You will all be unique individuals and you will all have unique things that you can do. But I would say you could all do something. You could all start a conversation with someone to understand this issue. And you could use your power, your uniqueness, whatever your talent is, to try to create change. So we actually have to do something. The conversation is not enough. Understanding is not enough. We have to take actual action. We have to do something. So we have to scrap our, our TED talk and talk about something else. We have to do something. We have to commit to conversations. One thing that I think is quite interesting to do is to observe who's in the room. Now, at this event, it's quite interesting. There's quite a mix of us. For my liking, there's not enough men in this room. That's not just because I like men. <laughs> Most men I find more attractive when silent. Um, I, I would love that to be edited out. Um, but you know, if we're wanting to learn about challenges in life, we need to look at who's in the room. Are all voices in the room? Have we got all voices in the room? Um, so I would encourage you to have the conversation, to ask, to explore, to understand, and get over that fear to be color brave and to look at who's in the room with you when you're working and to maybe ask the question, have we got all, everybody in the room? And have we really done everything to get everyone in the room? And maybe just to ask why. So just to close, I would just say, look, I'm still learning. I don't have the answers to this. I was shocked by what happened to me on Twitter. I was shocked that nobody wanted to engage in this topic. There is absolutely categorically fear amongst us to talk about what it's like for black women and men in our businesses. I, I, I'm absolutely clear about that. We must get over that fear. If we don't get over that fear, if we don't have the conversations, nothing will change. So I would love you all to use the hashtag, Colour Brave, 
spelt in the English way, <laughs> um, and share your stories, your inspiration about what you could do to try to change this and encourage everyone to be color brave and start to understand why our black women and men are not progressing and what we might learn from that so that we might change this situation. Thank you very much.